if I think about this bigger climate challenge, we're going to need some countries or territories or states or jurisdictions to experiment with policy innovations that raise essentially the capital that's needed to move decarbonisation forward, get the investments going and do so in a way that makes the political sponsors of those policies successful. And if that happens, other countries will copy and one by one we'll get this contagion effect. It'll take longer than an ex-ante agreement, but I think that's the way it'll work. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Benjamin Colley from Aurora Energy Research. And in today's episode of the show, we're going to be taking a global perspective on the energy transition. In particular, we'll be talking about the scale of the challenge for investing to decarbonize. We'll talk about how much capital is needed to decarbonize some of the most difficult sectors and what that means for the global economy as a whole. In the EU, carbon prices have been breaking records over the last year, but could we need future carbon prices of $100, $500, or even $5,000 per tonne? It's a complex set of topics, but fortunately I'm joined today by two experts in the field. My first guest is Sam Airy, the leader of the Utilities Equities Analysis Team at UBS. He has past experience working at the Boston Consulting Group, at the World Bank, and at the University of Oxford Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. Sam, thank you very much for joining us. Hey Ben, it's a great pleasure. Thanks for having me on. My second guest is Evangelos Gazis, a project leader at Aurora, who oversees our work in Southeast Europe. Evangelos was formerly a research associate at Imperial College London and co-authored the book, Energy Innovation for the 21st Century. Evangelos, it's good to have you with us. Many thanks for having me. Now, Sam, one way in which Aurora and UBS have worked together over the last few years is in preparing a regular report on the state of the global energy transition. When we do that, we usually focus on emissions from the power sector, And we use Aurora's global power market modeling to look at the future mix of generation technologies and the rate of deployment of renewables by region and so on. But last year in 2021, you suggested we go beyond the power sector. Would you like to tell us some more about the new questions you wanted to try and answer? Yeah, of course. And um, actually, just before I answer your question, you know, um, I I think I want to say it's been a real pleasure working with Aurora over the last few years. And um, uh, you know, I think uh, what you guys have been able to offer us is really a fantastic analytic capability, but also, you know, a good sense of not just what the numbers say in a spreadsheet, but also what's going on in the real world. You, um, you know, we really appreciate the contact you have with industry and the kind of grip you have on some of these questions. So put your fingers in your ears for a minute. And uh, sorry if I make you blush, but I wanted to start by just saying, you know, I think it's been a great collaboration between UBS and Aurora and uh, long may it continue. Thanks, Sam. Um, We we really appreciate the chance to work with you too. Well, um, moving on now, let me have a a crack at your question. I think you're absolutely right. You know, the first few uh, years of work we did together was definitely very contained within the the power sector. And uh, you helped us with kind of... um, power generation market forecast helped us think about how the renewable sector was going to develop. Essentially, you helped us build investment and returns forecast for the wind and solar sector, which was something that, um, you know, uh, financial markets didn't really have good visibility on a few years ago. Uh, But where I think now there's much more clarity uh, and where we're also, to tell you the truth, starting to bump up against kind of the limits um, of that approach and i explain what i mean by that with an example so if you you know if you've got a power market that's basically in in some kind of equilibrium but you're taking out coal and you're building renewables it's it's not super complicated is it to to do the analysis you you know you shut the coal plants you build a wind farm you balance it with gas i mean that's a real world trend that we're seeing you know on the ground in many countries and you can analyze it pretty clearly uh, from where we all stand today Uh, the outcome for the end customer doesn't really change. They're still getting electricity down the wires. Um, uh, it's cleaner than before, uh, but uh, it's the same 
service delivered. Um, of course, if you look ahead now into the future, I think this is going to change because the proportion of coal in power systems is trending towards zero. And of course, power systems overall, even including the gas, are only today contributing, what, what is it, a quarter or a third of global em emissions. And so uh, if we're going to make inroads into the kind of targets we have globally for decarbonisation, we are going to need to go beyond the power sector. We're going to have to go into sectors that use fossil fuels today, and we're going to have to electrify them uh, fundamentally. And we're familiar with that idea from transport, aren't we? Because we all know about this idea that we're going to get rid of our combustion, internal combustion engine vehicles and move to electric vehicles. But the same uh, is true for a bunch of other industries, including, you know, heavy industry like iron and steel, cement, chemicals, um, you know, as well as the buildings we live in uh, and, you know, the heavier end of the transport sector, you know, uh, trucking, shipping, aviation and so on. So... Uh, look, the idea for this year was kind of push the envelope a little bit and go beyond the standalone power market view and try and estimate the investment requirements for all these other parts of the global economy and not only estimate the investment cost in those sectors uh, for getting on a, on a net zero or one and a half degree uh, pathway, but work out what sort of carbon prices would make those investments economic. So that was, that was the challenge I gave you guys. Uh, not a small one, uh, but I think you did a, a, a great job on it. And we should talk a little bit about the work that you did. Thanks, Sam. And it's certainly an interesting challenge because it, we moved from looking at the, the power sector, from looking at one quite specific set of markets to try and tackle a much broader set of economic activities and the, uh, the, the subtleties of those. Now, I'd like to turn to Evangelos, who oversaw the, the project from the Aurora side alongside our, our colleague, Olivia Hahn. And Evangelos, you had the, the challenge of putting together this analysis and generating results. Could you tell us, first of all, about what the different sectors were that the study focused on and how you selected those out of uh, the full set of economic activities that generate emissions today? So, yeah, we had this discussion with Sam early on on how we are approaching this, and uh, we very quickly realized that we wanted to, to focus on, on the hard to decarbonize sectors. So we have talked a lot about certain sectors, but there are many other carbon and energy intensive sectors that we haven't really looked at in terms of decarbonization. So uh, we, we looked at the big picture. We, we, we took the whole um, um, the whole industrial sector uh, and try to break down into components and see which ones are the, the most uh, carbon intensive and um, we, we came up with six sectors that um, collectively compile, uh, co combined they, they provide about 50 percent of uh, global emissions today so these are the sectors are cement chemicals iron and steel production buildings road transport and aviation. So th these are the six main sectors um, that we looked into and tried to, to see what is the carbon price that would be required in order to incentivize uh, the carbonization or low carbon uh, or zero carbon alternatives to the conventional ways of doing things today. Um, taking a step back and looking at the big picture, at the moment, about 50 gigatons of, uh, of uh, carbon are, are um, emitted each year, and uh, gigatons of, of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. And uh, about three quarters of this um, is due to, to the energy use of uh, the in different processes, and the, the rest is mainly uh, emissions from agriculture and land use, as well as certain industrial processes. What we wanted to do in our analysis is to look at what um, are the, the alternatives, the zero carbon alternatives that can be incentivized so that we can avoid emissions from both energy processes, but also um, direct emissions from uh, the, uh, the process in, involved in these uh, sectors. And um, the main question that we wanted to ask is, what is the level of carbon pricing that would incentivize these alternatives? Not just um, make them... Um, break even in terms of, of cost competitiveness, but also the competitiveness in terms of the internal rate of return they achieve. So and that's a really important point, right? Often when we do these uh, analyses or when we've seen these analyses done elsewhere, the question has been, okay, what's the cost to you know, install the new equipment and to, to run it over its lifetime? But the, the key point is that if you actually want to incentivize a switch, 
in, uh, investors have to to see a, like as good a return from the the green investment as they do from the uh, business as usual investment. Exactly, Ben. And this is this was the, the main challenge because we had to start with what is the, the conventional way of doing things. So for each of those six sectors, we identified the main uh, conventional technology. What are the economics for this technology? Uh, if, if it is a, a, a sector that has a, a return, then what is the internal rate of return today? And then having identified uh, the most uh, promising alternative, zero carbon pro uh, alternative, we had to calculate the economics, but also the carbon price that would be required to make the investment as good as the conventional. Um, and, and I'm stressing the point that we did that for investments today. So we wanted to, to uh, ca calculate what the carbon price would need to be now in order to incentivize this alternative. And in order to do that, we, we had to uh, make a series of, of uh, assumptions um, regarding the, the, the power, for example, the power supply that is going into this alternative um, technology, or potentially the hydrogen supply. Um, in, in certain cases, it also uh, required carbon capture, transport and storage. So we had to make a series of assumptions regarding um, these technologies, um, but also, the, the, the assumptions around negative emissions. And that is an important bit because in many technologies, um, we, we, we are able to, to reach a certain level of decarbonization, but there is still uh, residual emissions. So what we found out is that in most sectors, you need a certain amount of negative emissions offsetting um, uh, the technologies that uh, will bring this to really uh, net zero. So um, maybe uh, we can work out an example and, and go through one particular example to, to make this more um, easy to understand. That would be great, Evangelos. We've set out that sort of uh, theoretical framework with quite a few different steps in it. I think the, the listeners would find it really useful to take a look at a specific example. Exactly. So one, one sector that uh, we, we looked at was um, uh, cement production. And um, cement production is one of these key sectors and really hard to decarbonize. At the moment, um, uh, cement is emitting about 6% of uh, global emissions. And um, uh, about two thirds of those emissions are, are process related and they have to do with uh, the, the way carbon is released uh, when you break down limestone, which is the, the, the feedstock. Um, and uh, about a third is um, is energy energy requirement to bring uh, to heat up the, the feedstock and and uh, um, yeah uh, create the the, the the cement produces cement. So, uh, this is this is quite interesting for me, Evangelos, mm -hmm. because you know I, I hadn't seen much about um, cement production before, but th this fact that okay we're trying to to decarbonize it. Part of that is about decarbonizing the the energy supply, but actually there's something fundamental to the the chemistry of producing cement that tends to lead to, to carbon emissions there as well, making decarbonizing it that more it, it, challenging. You exactly. can't just plug it into a wind farm for green electricity and say that you're done. That's exactly it. So one alternative in many uh, sectors is just to electrify uh, and um, making sure that your electricity is green or uh, zero carbon, then uh, you have a, a green process. However, in many cases, uh, there, there is some fundamental processing and releasing of carbon that needs to change. So in, in the cement um, production, for example, one alternative is to, to capture uh, the, the carbon that is emitted um, so with a process that is called uh, carbon capture and storage. But um, as, as we hinted earlier, this often is not 100% um, carbon free. Uh, you still have some residual emissions that you need to, to offset. Um, and we'll come to that in a minute. But before we go into that, maybe I can explain a little bit how we started this analysis on cement, which is by looking at the, the economics of the conventional way of doing, uh, of doing things today. So we looked at the typical cement plant today, um, and uh, we, we tried to calculate what is the internal rate of return. So how much money does a, a cement production facility make today? And um, we came up with a, a nominal internal rate of return of, of 10 to 14 percent uh, for a, a new plant uh, with a lifetime of 30 years today and a typical capacity of uh, 1 million tons of, of clinker per year. So this is our baseline 
and then we explored the alternatives. And there are many ways uh, you, you can improve the, the process, uh, you can electrify certain bits of the process, um, you can either uh, uh, use different ways, uh, like different chemistries to produce cement. However, not all of these technologies are able to, to decarbonize fully uh, the, the production of cement. One way to do it, though, is by using um, what we call the oxyfuel process, where we combine carbon capture and storage um, and also certain um, uh, low carbon um, uh, energy source, for example, biofuels. So if you use biofuel as your source of energy, then you can, um, uh, by, using, by also using carbon capture and storage, you are able to have negative emissions in the process of, uh, of energy um, processing. So that means you can truly make uh, cement at zero carbon. Um, I, I don't want to go into the details of the process, um, of the oxyfuel process, but um, what I wanted to say is that um, the, the whole production uh, process will be more expensive because you need new technology, you need new equipment, um, and uh, also you, you need to capture the, the carbon, transport it, store it. So these are all additional uh, cost components. And when we try to calculate the economics of this uh, new technology, we, we, we found out that in terms of capital expenditure, these technologies are about 80% more expensive. And in terms of operational expenditure, it's about 50% um, uh, more expensive to the conventional one, which means that if we don't assume any carbon price, then it wouldn't make any money. Uh, at current levels uh, of, of cement pricing, it, it would be negative um, uh, internal return. However, if we do apply a minimum carbon cost of about 25 to 45 per ton of carbon, then this technology would break even. So this is our starting point. This is how you make a, a, a positive IRR. But as we said in the start, what we want to, to do is not to check when this uh, technology become positive, but when they are competitive with uh, conventional technologies today. So in order to reach the, the conventional IRR of 10 to 14%, you would need a carbon price of, of around 80 to $100 per ton of carbon, which is uh, quite substantial compared to what we see now. So um, this is the level of, um, of carbon price that would be required uh, for, for this technology. And it, it is important to stress that this is just one of the, the potential technologies. So in different locations, there will be different options. For example, carbon capture and storage is not available everywhere because you need to have ways to capture your storage and, and store it. Uh, so in certain locations, it will be just too expensive to do it. Um, and there are alternatives. However, they are more expensive. So what we found out is this oxyfuel technology is on the on the the low cost um, of, of the curve uh, compared to, to alternatives. So just summing up the, the, the work that we did on cement, um, the, the, the average cost to abate um, carbon emissions in uh, the cement production is uh, about $145 uh, per ton of, of, of carbon. So this is what we then used in our, in our model uh, as, as the average cost to abate um, uh, cement emissions. Okay, and just to check, Emmanuel, you mentioned the figure of um, eighty to a hundred dollars per ton, but then that that higher figure of one hundred and forty-five dollars. What was the the step up between those two? So this is to do with the fact that um, oxyfuel is one of the cheapest uh, ways of, of food carbonizing cement. Right. Uh, but uh, given that uh, not everywhere, not not, not all uh, locations will have uh, the, the capability to do CCS, we expect other technologies as well to, to, to be used for decarbonization of cement. So the global average is expected to be higher. That's, that's why. I see, thank you. And it, it, I think find it really interesting that there's such a spread of carbon prices there. So the, the basic break-even carbon price, you're saying around uh, $25 a ton, and then you want to make it work for oxyfuel, taking into account the investor's need for a return, then it gets up to $80 to $100 a ton. And then if you want to think about the the global average, considering that you can't use the cheapest approach everywhere, then you're up to 145. Now, um, watchers of the carbon markets in the, the last year will have seen the EU's carbon price hitting record levels in recent months, up to the, the 60 to 90 euros a tonne level. So some of these um, carbon price levels that you know, would have seemed almost outlandish um, only a couple of years ago now seem within the, the realms of possibility. But I suppose one of the challenges for investors is that to really 
put the money into building out a plant that's going to have a really long lifetime, you need the confidence that prices are going to stay at a um, a, you know, a high level and um, for you know, for the duration. And yeah, you're very right, Ben. And also, it is very important to say that this was just cement. So we also looked at these other uh, sectors, and what we saw is um, different types of uh, different average uh, prices that are required, but also a wider distribution of, of prices that would be required in order to get 100% decarbonization in those sectors. For example, um, uh, the chemical sector has uh, an average carbon price uh, of about $250 per ton. However, the distribution is so wide that we expect that uh, in order to completely decarbonize chemical production, we will need to go beyond $500 per ton. Um, and, and that's an important, um, uh, important nuance here because often we, we look at the average However, what is important when we talk about net zero is to see what it will be required to, to, to abate the last, the most expensive um, uh, kilogram of, of carbon in its sector. Absolutely. So thank you very much for, for talking us through that analysis of Angelos. I'd like to, to turn back to Sam. Uh, now, Sam, I, I know you spend a lot of your time working with investors and a natural question for them is what the size of the investment opportunity is here in and trying to decarbonize these different parts of the economy. How did you set about thinking through what the sectoral analysis of costs that we've described that would mean for investment requirements? I mean, that was the great gift of the Aurora work here, is that by going through all these sectors for us and working out bottom up, you know, what the new technologies cost, uh, we can start to aggregate that and think what total investment requirements are going to be across the world and across the decades uh, that come. And of course, I should caveat this by saying, you know, any any analysis, even Aurora analysis that's looking 50 years or 80 years in advance to the end of the century across everything in the world economy. I mean, we know we're not going to uh, get the uh, answer uh, in a very precise way, uh, but we're just looking for directional conclusions. And the directional conclusion here is that the total investment requirement to decarbonize the planet is massively higher than people generally expect. And I think if you look in the literature, you, you'll typically see numbers bounded around in the sort of ballpark of a trillion dollars, a couple, or maybe two, three in the more bullish uh, estimates of you know, extra capex required annually to get us on a net zero pathway. And the takeaway from the work that Evangelos has described across the half dozen sectors that you looked at is that actually those numbers need to be uh, much higher, at least in the sort of three, four, five trillion a year. And maybe for some parts of this century, we might be looking at five, six, seven trillion dollars of additional investment requirement annually. And just let me put that in context, because when we start talking about these huge numbers, I mean, I don't know about you, but it's easy to kind of lose any kind of grip on, on what that really means. You know, what is what is five trillion dollars a year? But if um, I think the best reference point is what is current global you know, fixed capital formation or investment across the global economy. And in recent years, that's been running at around about 20 trillion a year uh, um, in, in, uh, in real terms. And um, that includes everything, you know, everything we invest in from kind of ice cream to space shuttles, you know, um, humanity's investment, 20 trillion a year. And we're going to need to increase that by maybe five, six, seven trillion a year. In, in the decades to come. So, I mean, that's a huge takeaway before I even get into the whole topic of carbon prices, uh, but it already raises some sort of economic and philosophical questions. I mean, the economic question is, how would we afford that, right? What is it? Is it more, more taxes? Uh, is it more debt that future generations will, will pay back? Uh, how, how are we actually gonna, gonna afford it? And the, um, and the sort of philosophical question is, can we actually do it? Do we, do we have real productive resources in the world economy sufficient to raise our investment level uh, by a quarter uh, or more uh, going forward? Um, and we don't know the answer to that, but I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't assume that the answer is, is yes. And to what extent of any, Sam, is there you know, the, the potential for some of the existing 20 trillion a year to be shifted into those, um, those low carbon investments that are needed? Well, that's probably, that's probably how, how we will end up uh, you know, attacking the problem. We will have to um, sacrifice some current activities and kind of replace them with um, kind of climate saving <laughs> activities. And you might say, well, that's obvious and that's a good thing. And I'll talk in a minute about the mechanisms through which we, 
we might be able to do that. Um, but again, it's an interesting philosophical question because, you know, as we shift investment into green areas, uh, people will talk about the creation of green jobs, obviously, and that'll look like uh, good for the economy. But we will still be sacrificing something because the end result is going to be that we still give people the same kind of energy service, if you like, that they're currently receiving from the fossil sector. We're just going to give it to them in the clean form. So we will achieve an environmental benefit, but what we'll have sacrificed is, you know, whatever else we were going to get from the 20 trillion of investment we would have been carrying out anyway in other things. And nobody knows what those are because they haven't been invented yet. So you see what I mean? We're kind of right at the boundary, not just of what you can understand in terms of modeling and what you can think about in terms of finance and numbers, but we're also kind of at the edge in this debate of, of sort of even just how we think about things is a totally underappreciated point but you know the targets that are out there imply turning a lot of ways we think about the world uh, on their head today yeah it's a really a, a big paradigm shift in the um you know the, the development of investment and of economic activity in the the years ahead i suppose one of the the key questions that arises from this when we talk about the scale of the challenge is how we would make it happen. You know, what can we do as a society to incentivize that kind of investment? And Evangelos mentioned carbon prices already. We've discussed that a little bit so far. Economists often point to, to carbon prices as the most efficient mechanism to encourage uh, these sorts of shifts towards lower carbon ways of doing things. From the, the study that, that we did and the thinking that, that you've done, Sam, and um, what uh, what was your overall conclusion on the sorts of levels of carbon prices that might be needed across the economy um, to, to get to the, uh, the, the targets that we want to achieve? Yeah, so Ben, that's the, if you like, the kind of, well, I don't want to say the um, million dollar question, because maybe it's a question worth, worth you know, what is the magnitude more than that? But it's a question on everybody's lips, if you like, how do we make uh, this happen? And the carbon price is, you know, uh, an interesting uh, lens to look at this through. Of course, there are many different policy approaches that we could see pursued around the world. Um, but if you if you boiled everything down to a carbon pricing approach, and if you like, use that as a proxy for a generally more assertive uh, environmental uh, policy around the world, then I think what we conclude from your work is that we'd need to see a, a universal carbon price uh, around the level of $100 a ton uh, today. So applying everywhere in the world. And then that would need to go up by 5% in real terms every year going forward. So by the middle of the century, we'd be on about you know, $500 a ton. And by the end of the century, we might be on $5,000 a ton. And those are the kind of assumptions that you need to plug into, into the model to get investment at the level required to get emissions down to um, the level required in a sort of one5 or net zero uh, pathway. So, you know, just, just again, to give that a bit of context, you mentioned that the European ETS has been um, uh, up at, at the high point around about 90 euros, $100 a ton. So you might say, well, actually, that doesn't sound um, uh, too scary, the idea that we need a, a global carbon price for $100 a ton. But of course, the ETS uh, in its current form covers just about 3 or 4% of global emissions. And there's nowhere else in the world at the moment that has carbon pricing close to uh, that level at scale. And um, we would need, so the implication is we'd need to kind of roll out the ETS at the peak of its recent pricing to the other kind of 96% of the world economy that's producing emissions. And of course, we're nowhere close to doing that uh, today. So yeah. um, pretty challenging outlook. It's a really massive challenge. And I suppose one of the most difficult things about setting up carbon prices at those sorts of levels is the politics, uh, both at a national level and an international level. Now, this might be a good stage to, to bring in the, uh, the UN COP26 summit that happened last year. Uh, that was an opportunity for governments from around the world to make some progress on agreements to address climate change. As usual, we didn't see much progress on carbon pricing. Um, so, uh, one thing I'd like to ask you about, Sam, is do you think there are characteristics of the, uh, the COP events that make them poorly suited to forming that kind of uh, agreement? And do you think there's an alternative way of doing, uh, doing things? 
I feel tempted to say the clue is in the name, you know, COP26. <laughs> it's the 26th one. And, uh, and where are we? Uh, we, I mean, people ask me a lot in my job, what did I think of the outcome of COP26? And was it a success or a failure? And I just point them to the footage of, you, you know, Alok Sharma closing the conference. And he says, I basically he's holding back tears. And he says, delegates, I apologize for the way this is all played out. Um, and you, you can see clearly that the organizers were disappointed not to have achieved uh, what they wanted to from the event. Uh, but if you take a step back, I think it's actually not surprising. Uh, the, 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 the COP format is a conference of parties. You're bringing together whatever it is now, 200 countries around the world to, to agree on some very difficult, challenging, expensive, you know, sometimes ideologically controversial uh, objectives. And the experience is that we're not succeeding in getting an ex ante agreement. But it doesn't mean we're not succeeding on anything. There are other examples around the world where policy norms have spread, you know, in a successful way. Um, in the environmental world, one that I like to point to is, you know, the adoption of unleaded petrol as a norm, which obviously started out decades ago, uh, you know, in California and then traveled to some other US states, other European countries, and then around the world. And there's now, I think, nowhere in the world where leaded petrol is the norm. Um, or very, very few places. Um, but it didn't happen by some great conference in the 1980s where the world agreed to get rid of leaded petrol. It happened by one or two jurisdictions, you know, uh, understanding the research, understanding the impact on um, cognitive development of children who grew up in areas where they were breathing the fumes from vehicles that were using leaded petrol and deciding to do something about it and finding a way to act on it that was politically acceptable. And so if I think about this bigger climate uh, challenge, I think we're more likely to see progress in that way. We're going to need some countries or territories or states or jurisdictions to experiment with policy innovations that raise uh, essentially the capital that's needed to move decarbonization forward, get the investments going, and do so in a way that makes the political sponsors of those policies successful. And if that happens, other countries will copy. And one by one, we'll get this contagion effect. It'll take longer than an ex ante agreement. But I think, I mean, I think that's the way it'll work. And if you look in other areas, like think about what we do with inflation targeting, with value added tax, with, with other kind of things that used to be seen as experimental public policies, but that are now kind of uh, globally accepted norms. You know, this is the way they've traveled around the world to the one country at a time until the norm is established. So, yeah, that's, that's the way I think it'll work. And it's good to know that there's still still hope for some of the, these policy measures. And I'd like to, to focus in again on uh, on carbon pricing. And I suppose one of the, the challenges with the, the early adopters uh, of carbon pricing, if they um, start to, to, to create or to push up their, their own carbon prices when their neighbors or their trading partners haven't, is that you have the risk of carbon leakage that you might have the more emitting industries choosing to relocate rather than choosing to, to decarbonize. It would be great to get your view, Sam, on uh, what the prospects might be for uh, the EU or for other countries introducing something like a carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, to mitigate that kind of leakage risk. Yeah, well, the, um, the European Union and its uh, Fit for 55 package has clearly uh, signaled the intention to introduce carbon border adjustment mechanisms. And you don't have to scratch your head for too long to think about why they need to do that. If you, um, if you impose a carbon tax on domestic activities within your borders and you don't apply any kind of balancing adjustment at the borders, then, you know, demand will shift to imports that don't pay the tax. That would seem to be the, the very obvious uh, consequence. And you will, uh, you, you know, you're at risk of damaging your own domestic uh, industries. And that would be no kind of solution. So I think anybody who's serious about carbon pricing has got to be serious about border adjustment mechanisms. The difficulty is that again, we're back in the zone of many countries needing to agree. And I think the EU signaled that whatever they would do, they would want to do within, you know, the parameters of today's WTO rules and regulations. Uh, but it's unclear exactly what that means. If that means, again, some kind of approach which is agreed ex ante through the WTO, the experts tell us you could assume that that's another 10 year process in the, uh, you know, at the fastest. Um, but maybe it's something which is just done unilaterally by, by Europe and 
and Europe kind of considers that they are staying within the rules, and then you have to wait and see whether other countries will, will challenge it or impose retaliatory tariffs or, or whatever. So the, the border adjustment side of this thing is very complicated, but it's, it's absolutely essential if we're going to see carbon prices rise in any parts of the world to a, to a more meaningful level. Right. So having discussed a bit about the, the challenges inherent in the, the COP process and some of the ways that policy might uh, might develop differently and at what we might hope for on, on carbon pricing in particular, it'd be really interesting uh, before we wrap up to have a, th- a think about what the, um, what the highlights might be in the year ahead. So there's another COP coming up at the, the end of this year. You know, we're interested to see whether Outside of that process, we might see more um, more advances from the EU side on the, the 55 package and the uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism associated with that. And are there any particular milestones or catalysts for for things changing that that you're looking forward to in the months ahead, Sam? Well, you mentioned some of the big ones there, but I think from where we're standing today in January 2022, I think we have to consider how we navigate our way out of the current energy price crisis. Um, I think, you know, a year or two ago, decarbonisation was the most important energy topic in policymakers' minds. I think where we're standing today, affordability and security of supply are becoming equally important, if not more important. So I think the first thing we need to see is some kind of resolution to prices at current levels, some kind of patterns emerging about how governments are going to deal with the impact on end users' bills, um, or which is being approached differently in different countries around the world. Uh, but we'll have to see uh, some kind of medium-term solution to all of that before we get really back into the uh, negotiation of the carbon targets. But when we get there, I think there's a good chance that the European Union will want to put through uh, a version, at least, of the Fit for 55 package. And that will be, hopefully, a, a signal and a stimulus for other parts of the world to do the same. So. You know, it's going to be an interesting year, lots to look forward to. It certainly will be a, a busy year. Uh, well, I'd like to thank everybody for, for tuning in to the, the podcast today. And Sam and Evangelos, thank you both very much for taking the time to, to speak with us. Thank you very much, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Ben. That was Benjamin Colley, Principal at Aurora, speaking to Sam Airy, Head of European Utilities Equity Research at UBS, and Evangelos Gazis, project leader and market lead for Southeastern Europe at Aurora. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.